We're going to be in 2 Samuel, which is your Old Testament. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is the last of the installments in the study for David in preparation for the bus trip next week. Uh, thanks again for Joe Salyer and everybody else who's had a part in putting that together. I know you're going to have a wonderful time. Unfortunately, uh, I won't be able to go. My, my bride will be able to go along with what we call the two moms. And they'll both be, all three of them are going. Um, last year, I did that trip with them. And so now it's her opportunity to do that. And, uh, and Doug, I get to yeah, go with them. Yeah, when I crawled around the bottom of the bus looking for my mom's crochet yarn, I... I, I was going to say, didn't they have another spill also? You had to help clean yeah, it was That's all kinds of stuff. So we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll let Katie crawl around the, the floor of the, the bus. Um, so today... Um, <laughs> Pastor Larry, he, he wanted a topic that I was really, really good at, so it's called David the Sinner, so, um, and I'm really, really good at sinning, so I can relate well to the subject today. Uh, so before we read it, it, it is interesting that people sometimes uh, who struggle with the Word, who struggle with Scripture, will often say that the Bible glosses over the wrong that the heroes of the Bible do. Um, there, in fact, I, I got to watch a, uh, a little bit of a video presentation where a, a Christian apologist is speaking to a college group and, and a number of the speakers, you could tell they, they were kind of uh, agnostics, which means they're a little uncertain about God or atheists, meaning they don't believe in a God. Um, and they were they were kind of bashing the Bible, you know, is, is dealing with is, is, is it accurate? Uh, it, it kind of, one of them, he says, well, they, they gloss over a lot of the sins of the people of the Bible. Well, if you read some of the Bible carefully, you will soon discover that there's no glossing over here. Okay. There's no glossing over at all. In fact, uh, David, who is one of the great heroes of the the faith of the Hebrew people, um, really, for Judaism, is kind of the core. Moses and David are just really kind of core <laughs> central figures in, in their faith. Um, they don't gloss over it at all, okay? And, and 2 Samuel does a great job of exposing David kind of behind the scenes and, and um I know that the, the when you go to see next week, David, uh, it'll be a great performance. I encourage you to continue to read Second Samuel. Read all the way through. Um, and then if you have a chance, well, no, I'm sorry, let me take that back. Then I challenge you to read First and Second Kings because it kind of bookends First and Second Samuel. Um, a little more broad, broad brush about uh, Israel and Judah and the kings who ruled that, but the behaviors of the people, and that's where we learn. When we begin to read Bible stories and say, you know, how does this parallel my life? That's when we begin to learn. That's when we can begin to apply scripture, so I encourage that, and so today as we read about uh, David, you know, the character of the Lady Bathsheba, the character of Uriah the Hittite, uh, let me put this in perspective so you understand. Um, the, the people of the Middle East were very methodical about war. During planting season and harvest season, they never fought or hardly ever fought. And part of the reason for that is you, your civilization would starve to death if all of your fighting men were out fighting and the crops didn't get planted, or they didn't get harvested. So uh, when you read in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 in particular, when it says, now at the time when the kings went out to war, it was either, it was between harvest or planting and harvest season, okay? It was before or after, it was hardly ever during. Um, and that's important to recognize. Normally what happens is when, when people of the Bible get in trouble, it's because they have gone out of the will of God, right? That's kind of gone out of the will of God. Now, let's make sure we define sin for a moment, okay? Somebody defines sin, and 
Kim Campbell, if you decide to define it for us, do not use your husband's name in the definition. Okay? So define sin without your husband's name being in there. See if you can do that, Kim. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Disobedience to God. Disobedience to God. Okay. A good, straightforward definition. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Breaking the Ten Commandments. One or more. Breaking the Ten Commandments. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I would say giving in to evil thoughts. Giving in to evil and thoughts. Taking action. And taking action. Okay. Anybody else? All are fair definitions. So another way to look at sin is separation. Sin is separation. Okay. Um, when I was a tech years ago, uh, they in, involved in Campus Crusade for Christ. And we, when we went out on evangelistic trips uh, through the campus, uh, we'd hand out the, the, the four-step method, you know, um, and one of those concepts is, is that there's a holy God, and how does an unholy man, how does a carnal man who is not holy reach God, right? And there is no way for us to reach God in our current state. It's only by the gift and the sanctification of Jesus Christ, that we have that opportunity when we come into a faith relationship. We now, in the eyes of God, are no longer unholy. We are now made holy by the gift of the cross. Okay. And so we have to appreciate that sin is separation, separation from the purpose and the, the plan of God Himself. And when we think about those definitions that were all good definitions. I want you to also recognize today in our story, when our professional orator reads in a moment, uh, that you will recognize clearly that there is a separation from God's plan here, okay? And it's not just one level. Here's the thing about the story of David and Bathsheba that really puts things into a, a, a maybe a broader picture of sin for you, is we all think in terms of sin harming one person or sin affecting one person a lot of times it is a multiplier effect um, so think of this if you've ever had a real still pond or lake or big mud puddle whatever it might be and you take a rock and you throw it in and and you see the amplitude um, uh, waves right the little waves that go out um, and as you watch them, they just continue on and on and on. And uh, so you recognize that that rock splashed here, but the whole thing's affected. That's kind of the way I need you to think about sin today as we read this story. Stacy? The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. That is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I know you king over Israel. And I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives in your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judea. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what, e what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonite rites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house 
because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah, a Hittite, to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But by doing, but because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Son born to you will die. So there are consequences to sin, right? God has clear consequences to sin. Now, if you continue to read chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, you'll see that eventually David does something that uh, is very comforting to us in a lot of ways. The child is sick for a period of time. Uh, most of your translations will say for seven days. Some, some of the very early manuscripts say eight days, but um, for seven days. And David mourns, he fasts, he weeps in front of God. And then the baby dies, and the servants are scared to death to tell David because he behaves this way. He has had so much sorrow, the baby has, has, has been ill, that if the baby dies, he's just, the servants are convinced that David might do something dramatic, maybe even take his own life. And, uh, and then David gets up after he hears that and cleans himself, he ritually washes and bathes. And then he asked for food and drink to be brought to him. And they're confused. And he said, he says this later on. Um, let me read it to you so that we get it get right. Um, but it's very comforting for parents. Um, yes, they replied, he is dead. That David got up from the ground after he washed, put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worship. Then he went to his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way while the child is alive and you fasted and wept? But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, now this is where it's very comforting for us. A lot of, I believe correctly, we can interpret it this way. Um, he answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So, um, Amen. you know, you hear, you hear, unfortunately, some people who aren't good students of the Bible. They will talk about the fact that a child that dies can have no possible way of getting to heaven because they don't understand and know to make a decision about that. This is scripture proof, I believe, very clear proof that children go to be with the Lord, okay? And so that's important. Now, I want you to see this. Um, Stacy. you did such a great job of reading. We're going to give you a chance to even show your skills off more, okay? Would you read 50, Psalm 51? Psalm 51. That's right after Psalm 50. Okay. Yeah, 452. I'm just helping you narrow it down. Oh, thank you. Okay. Now, this Psalm is specifically written, specifically written for, by David. And it deals with this thing that he's going through. Okay. Psalm 51. You'll, you'll see that it's uh, the theme is David's plea for mercy, right? For mercy and forgiveness. Sorry, Doug. I just thought you were always really prepared, Stacy, but that's okay. You're doing great. You're doing yeah. great. Now, when she finally gets there, I really want you to pay attention to all of it but particularly verses 10 through 12, okay? You ready, Stacy? Psalm 51. Psalm 51, yes, ma'am. Right after 50. Yeah, go ahead. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. 
Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquity. This is verse 10. Go ahead. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Perfect. Thank you. On, on the count of three, let's let's uh, let's give her a single clap. You ready? One, two, three. Well done. Good job. Now, um, now here's what I want you to grab is is ten and twelve that, that you heard. Created me a, a pure heart, oh God. Okay. So so hear David's desire here. I also want to take you forward to uh, verses 16, 17. Read it for you again. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. Remember, David is used to sacrifices. But he's making he's making the the point that we need to hear uh, 2,800 years later. Okay, after David was here, we need to make this point, and that is, um, you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Okay, so if you wonder how do I approach God, we approach God in a serious manner when we're asking forgiveness of sins, we, we approach it with the understanding that we are broken. It's not that his rules are too hard. It's not that, that the regulations that we seem to gather from the Bible are too hard. It's the fact of that it's our heart that's broken. God's plan is not broken. God's desires are not broken. We as humans are. Now, you, you may or may not turn there, but uh, 1 Timothy 1.15. Now, remember, uh, both First and Second Timothy and Titus are called the, the pastoral epistles, meaning that they were kind of written to teach the early church how to behave, how to, how to structure, how to, to select, and uh, what, what some of your scriptures would say, overseers or bishops, or, or we would interpret as pastors. But it also goes into detail on how they should be and behave. And here's what Paul writes Timothy, a young pastor now, okay? Um, some would say that Timothy must have struggled a little bit because Paul kind of gives him some very clear directions in 2 Timothy says, don't neglect drinking and wine because of your stomach, you know, and, and those kind of things. But here's what he says. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Now, this is Paul writing this. OK, the guy who wrote basically two thirds of the New Testament, Paul saying to Timothy, look, Christ came to the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Right. And and that's an important concept for us to understand as we think about sin. Right. And and the reason we're going to get to this is because it's not just a concept of 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 the thought of. Is it, is it relative or is it realistic? I think I want to draw your attention to those things because I want to put this in some tension. Some um, When I say tension, uh, tension to the opposite ends of the spectrum. All right. But first, let's, let's look at this in, in a realistic way. So what or whom do you compare, compare yourself to? What or whom do you compare your life to? 
Okay. Now, relative comparison. We have what's called relative truth in today's world. And relative, relativism means that I am going to compare myself relatively to those circumstances, situations, people, or situations around me, right? It's relative. So what is true? Okay, what is true? The truth is that you have your beliefs on what truth is, and I have my beliefs, and they really don't collide very much. So we both can be right, right? And one of the things I've tried to teach you over the many months is this concept of non-contradiction. The, the philosophy of, of non-contradiction says that opposite ideas, opposite circumstances or situations cannot both be true, okay? Because they're opposite. They both can't be true. We can say they are, but they really can't be. And so what's really important for us to understand is if you look around the world and say, well, <clears throat> compared to fill in the blank, I'm a really good guy. Okay. Now, I don't think it's appropriate. Don't put Steve Campbell's name in here. It's not fair, okay? Don't do that, all right? But, well, compared to, I'm a really good guy. I'm a really, oh, sorry, good guy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a really guy. I'm a really good guy, right? And, and we say that a lot in comparing ourselves to others because it's kind of a natural thing. It's human nature that says, well, I, I, I've got to make myself feel good. The world doesn't make me feel as good as I, I, I want to be. So we have a tendency to compare ourselves. It's something we do all the time. The, the school system doesn't mean to, but it does it in ways that are sometimes soul crushing for certain students. 30 some years ago when I was an ag teacher, um, as an ag teacher, a lot of times Ken will tell you that the guidance department, particularly at the high school level says, oh, we've got this guy and the other teachers don't know how to work with him. We think you can. So, um, you know, in, in one of my classes, I had the salutatorian, okay, of the senior high school graduating class. And I had a young man that read on about the second grade level. Okay, the same class, all right? Now think about the challenges of teaching that. Now, so the thing is, is in his case, he had all, the, the guy who was only a second grade reading level, he had always been compared to other kids, okay? Now, the thing is, and I remember looking it up, his IQ was slightly above 100, okay? Now, just so you know, when you talk about IQ, it, you know, we kind of joke, yeah, your age is the same as your IQ, that kind of thing. If you have an 80 IQ, there's a really good possibility that you may never learn how to tie your shoelaces. Okay? I mean, it's that, it's that much of a difference. It's an exponential chart on IQ. So 100 is considered what society would say is reasonable and normal in a comparative way to everybody else, right? So this young man had an IQ of 100, but he had all kinds of undiagnosed learning disabilities. And because the society just moved him along, he was a minority, so society just kept moving him along. Turns out he was a mechanical genius, okay? So we, we used that, and, and we, we gained some, some real ability for him to feel good about himself. But when he compared himself to other students in reading, he was always a loser. That's what, that's what he felt like, right? So we gave him an opportunity to compare himself in the shop. And he shot, you know, he was, he was always the guy who welded best and first. And, and so we could do that, all right? When he left, that was his career, right? He struggled to read the words on his diploma when he graduated. But, you know, he ended up being very successful in, in, in fields, in vocational stuff. So I just want you to know that the world does that, right? We can't help ourselves. We compare ourselves. It's always a record, right? It's always, well, I, 
I, I used to run the mile at this speed, now I run it at this. I used to be able to hit this many free throws, now I do this. We, we do it all throughout people growing up. We don't mean to, but we compare our children to each other or to their cousins or to the neighborhood kids, okay? And as a result, we seem to think that that's the way we should look at sin. Compared to that person, I'm a really good person. Compared to them, I know my Bible really well. Compared to them, I love other people a lot better. Compared to them, I forgive people better, right? And what Paul says, and here's what he says, Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. You hear who he's beginning to compare us to? Christ Jesus. And when we compare ourselves to Christ, we then realize how horrible, bad, terrible sinners we are. So if you compare yourself to me, you're a really good guy. Okay? But if you begin to compare yourself to Christ, you begin to see, I missed that mark. I didn't give enough grace here. I wasn't merciful enough. I didn't love enough. I, I should have been more patient. You see where we're going with this? So this is relativism. But what realistic comparison is, is what God calls us to do, is he calls us realistically to compare ourselves to the model, to the example of perfection. To Jesus himself. When you begin to do that, your heart begins to break because you begin to realize, well, compared to Jesus, I'm really not a good guy. Okay? I'm really not a good guy. I miss the mark a lot. And so I don't want you to walk out of the room thinking there's no hope. I don't want you to feel like I hope that I'm not making you feel terrible about yourself. I am intending to give you realistic comparison, not relative. Okay? Realistic, not relative. Don't look around the room and say, hmm, I know about their life, and I know about that life, and I know about this life, and I'm a good person. Okay? And so if every NBA basketball player came and watched me shoot baskets and then that's their comparison, they have no hope of ever making it in the NBA, okay? okay? They need to compare themselves to somebody else, the greatest, right? And, and I would encourage you to begin to recognize that God calls us to realistically look at Jesus in our world and say, am I more like him or am I like everybody else? Realistically. Don't look relativity, look relatively around. Instead, look realistically around and say, I want to be more like Jesus. Now, here's a healthy pattern. Um, so I want you to recognize the reality of man. All right. Um, Psalm 51 5 says it this way. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Um, Romans in a couple of places says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's really important to recognize that, that we are born this way, right? Um, the sins of Adam continue to pass down. And how might you articulate that? Kind of the sins of Adam. What does that mean? <coughs> <laughs> yeah, so we we all kind of say that um, we we recognize that again Adam and Eve kind of set the tone for the rest of man, right? Well, why is that the case? Because God gave us the freedom of choice, and our human nature is always going to go for yeah. me, me, me. Yeah. You know, they're, they're born, we're born sinful. We are born because our parents sinned and, and their parents sinned before them and their parents before them. And guess what? I've sinned. So my children were born in sin and, and their children are born. You get it? it, it it's, kind of a, it's kind of a stain on us. It's, it's kind of what humanity is. So we're born into sin, all right? 
it's that free will concept that man inevitably will make decisions that aren't good ones. Now, we do we live in sin? Uh, and I wrote on your outlines that we are we're kind of that concept of we are sinners. Um, we're kind of sinners by nature and, and by deed. And, I, you know, it's because as human beings, we want what we want, right? We want what we want, we want it when we want it. And so in Ephesians 2, 3, here's what it says. All of us also lived among them at one time, talking about living among sinners, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Okay. So we were deserving of wrath uh, because as human beings, we make those decisions that are against, against the desires of God, against his plan. And I, I think if you can look at sin sometimes and say, God's plan is not for man to sin. God had a great plan. Look at Adam and Eve. Uh, remember, as you, as you look at Genesis and you read the first couple of chapters, you see this great plan that God had in place. And it even says that God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. All right. So think about this. God himself walked beside Adam in the garden. I mean, they just walked along and talked, right? Direct relationship. And then Adam made a decision. Yeah. And Adam made a decision, right? Along with Eve. And, and there they are. Suddenly, God separates from me. Because a holy God cannot be an unholy presence and separates. Now, so we're born in sin. And then we have this thing about we live in sin. And look at Romans 15 or Romans 5, 18, 21. Let me read it to you. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. He's talking about Adam and Eve's sin. So also one righteous act resulted in justification in life for all people. Who's he talking about now? Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. That's right. For just as though, just as through the disobedient, disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. Okay? And then it goes on. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So... Um, He's upstairs right now. Levi Snap is involved in Kairos, which is a prison ministry. Pastor Larry's been involved in that. A number of people in our church uh, satellite, if you will, have been involved in, in prison ministry where they go into prisons and actually minister to prisoners. And, uh, you know, when you hear their story relatively in comparison to yours, and they came to know Jesus Christ personally as their Savior, you think about, wow. I screwed up a lot of places. What kind of grace did they need? So when Paul says, all the more, grace all the more, right? So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness, bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So um, when you hear this concept of you're born in sin, you live in sin, you die in sin. You don't have to die in sin. And further, you don't have to live in sin. Are we sinners? Yes. Yes. We're all sinners. But we don't have to let sin be our title. And at death, we don't have to let sin be what captures us. As I said to the, the, at the funeral service yesterday for Kelly Canutis, um, it's interesting when you stand on this side of the pulpit, or the speaker's lectern um, at a funeral service and you watch the faces of people, uh, there are many who come out of respect for the family, okay? And they're sitting there. At some point, though, you can see on their face as you're talking that they kind of think, hmm, I'll be there one day. I'll be where that guy or gal is laying in that casket. That'll be me. And then what? And that's a question I ask at most funeral services that I officiate. And then what? You know, it's easy to sit here in and, and a funeral service and you look around and you say, oh, I'm sorry for the family and, and it's all good, right? But at some point, it has to cross your mind, that will be me one day. 
and then what? Right. So we don't we're born in sin. You can't change that you and I were born the way we were. No matter how good your family is, there's sin in that family, right? Because we're human beings. And you and I have sin, and we continue to sin at times. But that doesn't have to be what defines us. It doesn't have to be what settles at the end, okay? And thanks be to God that there is available ways of getting out of it. Now, secondly, a healthy pattern is compare your lives, your deeds, your actions, your thoughts, your words to the perfect model. When, when I compare anything that I do to the masters, okay, um, when I compare it to that, it makes me better, okay? It makes me realize my shortcomings, my faults, my, my, my things I need to change, and it makes me better. So if I compare to you and you compare to me, we, we have targets that aren't high enough, right? Instead, compare yourself to others, which is why when I train public speakers as an FFA advisor, I always videotape them. And then I let them watch the videotape of their presentation. Then I showed them the videotape of the last year's national winner in public speaking in the FFA convention. And I didn't do it to put them down. I did it to say, you just got to see yourself. Now you get to see somebody who won the national competition. You see the opportunities for improvement. And each time it made them better because they were comparing themselves to the best, right? Not, not to the ones who won a local contest, but the ones who won it all. And so I think we, we just have to kind of compare, the, compare your life, your deeds, your thoughts, your actions to Jesus himself, all right? Thirdly, recognize grace in your life. Um, you know, there is a balance. Pastor Larry will tell you there is a balance when you preach and teach on this concept of conviction and the concept of grace. If all we talk about is grace, no one ever talks about sin. Soon everybody walks around saying, you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay, right? Uh, we have to be reminded that it is, as we become more perfected in our faith with Christ, that we are sinners. And there's that balance that I hope today you can hear some of that. But what I would encourage you, a healthy pattern, is to recognize the reality of us as human beings, to compare your life, your deeds, your actions, your thoughts, those situations in your life to the model of Jesus to make you better, and then to recognize grace for yourself, for others, and recognize grace from Christ. Okay, that's why he came to the world was to give grace. So if you leave here and you think there's no hope for me, then I failed as a teacher today. Okay, I failed as a teacher if you think there's no hope. If you feel convicted about parts of your life after you've left here, I chalk that up as a win, right? But I hope you recognize that you need to give grace to yourself, to others, and from Christ. Some of you are great at giving grace to others and horrible giving grace to yourself. Okay? Now, generally speaking, most of us are really good at giving grace to ourselves, not so good at giving it to others. Do not look at my wife right now. Do not look at my wife. You did. See, I told you not to. Four, established patterns that lead away, should be a comma there, sorry, that lead away, not to sin. Lead away from sin, not to it. Okay, establish patterns in your life, okay? And by that, I mean patterns, habits, routines, and surroundings. So um, I, I have counseled people about things in their lives that you would call addictions, okay? Um, I've, I've counseled people about drug and alcohol and pornography addictions. And so in all of those cases, we talk about their surroundings, we talk about the people that they're in connection with and their contact with. We talk about social media. We talk about websites. We talk about those kind of things because here's what happens. Sometimes things lead us to sin and we are prone to them. So maybe, uh, let's pull one out. Maybe you are prone to gossip. Okay, maybe you're prone to gossip. And so the first thing you do up in the morning is you immediately open up Facebook and you go, hmm, what are they saying now? And then you add your comments to it, okay? 
it's drawing you in, right? It's drawing you in. Um, if someone's addicted to pornography, what websites are you going to because they will draw you in, okay? And like most sin, once it has you, it kind of grips you and it's hard to get away. If, if you're battling with, with alcohol addiction, um, okay, my buddy's called and said, we're just going to go out and we're only going to have one beer. What are you doing? What are you doing? Just hook an, an IV into your arm and pump in alcohol because one beer is going to be a dozen for you or it's going to be a case. Don't go out with your friends, okay? I mean, that tell people you've got the wrong set of friends for the problem that you have, okay? And one young man said, you're right. I can't be with them now. And I said, look, I'm not saying they can't be friends they can't be friends you hang around with right now until you get your addiction under control until you have mastered that they will pull you in to the wrong behavior not keep you away all right so again there are patterns in your life that can help you lead you away from sinful behavior not to it and those are things that we can help you with but it's important that you look at your patterns, your habits, your routines, your surroundings, all right? And, and for everybody that's different, right? Um, you, you have to be very intentional about this concept of how do I deal with sin in my life? And if you notice, David's model for us is that David, once he was convicted of sin, he really went all out after it. And here's an exciting part of that story that, that people often miss when they read uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12. As you go through the whole chapter, you know, God in his way of correcting David took that baby away from David and Bathsheba. It was a baby of sin. Read further in that story and you'll see that after a time of mourning, it says that David brought Bathsheba into him and they made love and they had another child. You know what that child's name was? Solomon. Oh, Solomon. Okay. So you see, God's desire is to convict us of sin, bring us out of it, and give us wholeness in relationships. That's God's desire for all of us. Right? Now, quickly, we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The power of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. If you hear language in your mind, okay, if it's like a little, little voice in your mind that's saying you're no good, you'll never amount to anything, God cannot possibly love you, that is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit would probably sound like this. God wants better for you than that. You know that's not right. Jesus wants to give you grace. Jesus wants you to change. The Holy Spirit is designed to convict us of sin. In fact, in Romans chapter 8 says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So there is no condemnation for us when we are in Christ Jesus. Instead, there is conviction to bring us out of sin and into a light that more mimics what Jesus would call us to be as people of faith. So uh, there's a little quote at the bottom that I like. I got it out of gotquestions.org. If, you, if you're looking for a good website to go to, if you have questions, uh, I find this one to be very solidly biblically based, gotquestions.org. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world so that the world might have life through faith in his sacrifice. That's not fair. That's grace. Let's send the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that life doesn't always have to feel fair, but you are always a God of grace. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Convict us of our sins. We are not to be condemned by Satan for our sins, but rather we are to change to be more like Jesus. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Don't forget, uh, next Sunday is uh, Bid for Help.